Um, this story out of Arizona, and let me start off by saying right now, everyone is saying no foul play is suspected. But it's still a mystery to me exactly what happened here and why it happened. We're talking about the death of, of a young woman, 31 years old, Angela Tremonti. She's from Massachusetts, um, and she's on Instagram, very prolific on Instagram. And there's a guy in Phoenix. His name is Dario uh, Dizdar, and he's very prolific on, on Instagram. And they kind of meet each other, and they're going back and forth for a couple months. And then she decides to fly from Massachusetts to Arizona, and I guess they're going to meet in person. I mean, it's like a storybook kind of thing. But within 24 hours of landing, she ends up dead. Did I mention that he is a Phoenix police officer? Our affiliate, KNXV, the investigators there doing an unbelievable job. Take a listen to more of the story. It was across the street from Phoenix Police Headquarters on Thursday when ABC 15 News crew was parked and suddenly spotted Officer Dario Dizdar. It caught our journalists completely off guard, which is why the video you're about to see begins out of focus and overexposed. I got my statement out the to the before we get the camera out and rolling, Dizdar told ABC 15 Zach Crenshaw the story being told about him is wrong. So Zach asked him to tell us more, and what you just saw is what he said in return. So let's play it again. I got my statement out of the game to this Afterwards, our cameras watched Dizdar walk into police headquarters, but that's not the end of what happened. But before we tell you more, here's some important new details about Angela Tremonte and what happened the day she died. ABC 15 obtained this official incident report from a Phoenix Park Ranger. It gives specific details about how rescuers finally found Tremonte after hours of searching. Quote, Fire was in contact with Phoenix police and had them ping her phone. When that wasn't enough, Fire was able to have a friend of Angela use an iPhone application to get a more accurate ping. By narrowing down the area, PD units went door to door, knocking in the neighborhood. Angela's body was found in the backyard of this home on the side of Camelback Mountain. And while the park ranger's report clears up how she was found, it also raises more questions. The most obvious, if her phone was on, why didn't she call for help? But it also raises concerns about the evolving story we're getting from police and fire officials. Here's what Fire first said at the scene about this officer. Uh, he's been living here for a while, he said, and he's very familiar with this mountain. Says he hikes it at this time of day all the time from the top to the bottom. Then this week, fire officials called our newsroom and asked us to stop using that soundbite because they misunderstood Dizdar. They claimed he hadn't hiked Camelback in years. He got lost himself on the way down and had to Uber back to the parking lot. But in the park ranger's incident report, it states Dizdar told the ranger, quote, he was local and did this hike all of the time. And remember, the officials say neither Dizdar nor Tremonte brought any water. Halfway up, she becomes overheated, wants to turn around. He tells her to turn around, go back down to the parking lot. He continues up to the peak, makes his way up to the top, comes all the way back down to the parking lot. She's not here. Tremonte was from the Boston area. She flew in to meet Dizdar for the first time. The two had been chatting online. So there's a lot more our news crew wanted to ask Dizdar when he came back out of PD headquarters. Instead, Phoenix Public Information officers came out with his keys and moved his car. A spokesperson told our reporter it's because they didn't want anyone to recognize his vehicle. All right. And now, there's a lot to talk about in, the, in this story. Um, but the, the first thing that's very obvious to me is, is if they're hiking this mountain together, she's not feeling well, so he tells her to go back to the car and he finishes the hike. She flew from Massachusetts to Arizona to meet him. There's, there's no chivalry whatsoever. I mean, he... he you know, and again, no foul play suspected here, but my goodness. I mean, this, this young woman flies across the country to meet you, and within 24 hours you're taking her on a hike without water, which is not smart anyway. Isn't that a desert? And, and, and then when she's not feeling well, you let her go off on her own and you finish the hike? Like the hike is more important than the woman who flew across the country to see you? I don't understand that. But no foul play is suspected. Let's bring in our guest tonight. Joining us in Jacksonville, Alabama, Professor of Forensics at Jacksonville State University, Forensic Media Analyst and former Senior Investigator for the Fulton County Medical Examiner's Office, Joseph Scott Morgan is with us. And in San Diego, California, retired Director of the San Diego Police Department Crime Lab, Jennifer Shen, welcome to you both. Um, you know, the whole thing I just said, that, let's, let's put that aside for a second. To me, that's the very obvious part of this story that I don't understand, right? 
Uh, but let's get into what happened here. Joseph Scott Morgan, I want to start with you because this is a big part of it. She had just flown, and I guess within 24 hours is in a hike in the desert without water, flying and, and being dehydrated kind of go hand in hand is my understanding. Um, explain to us what could happen to someone if in fact you're in the desert and you're starting to get dehydrated and, and you've got a phone that's working, but you don't use it. Well, if you're, if you're dehydrated, which is what you could potentially be looking at, uh, you're talking about disorientation. Uh, you're talking about uh, convulsions, perhaps, uh, severe stomach cramping. It all depends on how diminished she was physically, uh, Vinny. And I got to say something here. Uh, they don't call it the Valley of the Sun for nothing, particularly this time of the year. Many, many years ago when, you know, dinosaurs roamed the earth, I was stationed in Arizona uh, in the Army, and it's brutal. This weather's brutal. And this young man, this officer, he should know better than anybody what that environment is like. And you take this young woman who flies from the East Coast from a completely different environment than this and introduce her into this environment. You don't supply her with water. It is a deadly, deadly combination. Yeah, it doesn't make sense to me. Jennifer Shen, let me ask you about where she's found. She's found, uh, it seems, in someone's backyard at the... the towards the base of the mountain, uh, and they were able to track her down because her phone was still on. So they were pinging it and, and found her that way. What are the things that you would look for at the scene where she is found? Well, I mean, it certainly seems like she made her way there, and I totally agree with everything that's been said. If you're dehydrated, you're confused, disoriented, you could be in some severe physical distress. So, I mean, I guess you'd be looking to see, um, you know, where that house was in relation to the bottom of that trail, what kind of uh, physical injuries she may or may not have. But, I mean, I just am... I just absolutely can't understand why you would go on a hike in Phoenix, Arizona area at this time of year with no water. Uh, it does really, really make you wonder what was going on there. Yeah, I don't know why you would go on a hike with water this time of year there. <laughs> um, Joseph, uh, you know, the other part of this is a lot of her friends have been speaking out uh, to media in, in, Bo in the Boston area, and a lot of them are saying, you know, she was a, like a fitness person. She didn't go anywhere yeah. without a gallon of water with her. And yeah. I, I, that, it doesn't make sense. It just doesn't make sense. So um, are there any, the, the, the medical examiner's report here is, is, could end any investigation into foul play, but might answer, would, should answer all the questions here, shouldn't it? Uh, well, to a certain degree, I think that it would. I, I think, I think, what I would be interested in from a medical legal standpoint, first off, is was she actually in the backyard of this home or was she outside of a barrier? You know, I noticed that a gate on the front of the house that would lead me at least a big assumption here that this thing was fenced all the way around. Was she inside of the backyard? How did she get there? Is there an external access? And then examining her body. Uh, you know, it seems like there's a little bit of confusion over time here. You know, one of the beautiful things about science, uh, Vin, is the fact that uh, post-mortem interval, one of the things that we look at in medical legal death investigation, we begin to talk about rigor mortis. We begin to talk about algor mortis, which is, of course, uh, the temperature of the body. Uh, we uh, talk about liver mortis, the settling of blood, and also stomach content here. I'd like to know what was going on when they first observed her at the scene. Did they make very detailed note of her body at that time, not just injuries, but postmortem changes? That's going to tell us a lot. And that'll be impacted uh, very, very distinctly by these environmental conditions, uh, of Vinny. And then we want to take a look at the injuries she may or may not have sustained. Uh, what did her hands look like, her, her arms, her knees? Uh, her legs, was there any bruising uh, underneath her hairline? I'd like to know what's going on relative to any kind of trauma that can point us in a very specific direction. Now, more revelations. Again, our affiliate KNXV doing uh, incredible work. Um, this officer, Dario Dizdar, did get into a little bit of trouble, a little bit of hot water about 12 years ago, and there's an in internal uh, investigation report on that. I want to put it up on the screen. On September 5th, 2009, at approximately 0015 hours, while off duty, 
Officer Dizdar gave false information to an officer of the Glendale Police Department during a criminal investigation. Now some more of the details about this investigation. The officer questioned uh, Officer Dizdar about Officer Dizdar's friend who had allegedly been assaulted earlier outside of the bar, okay? Officer Dizdar identified himself as a Phoenix police officer and then provided a false name and date of birth to the Glendale officer. Officer Dizdar also intentionally uh, provided an incorrect phone number for the victim to the same Glendale officer. Dizdar, though, notified his supervisor approximately 10 hours later at the beginning of his next shift and apologized to and cooperated uh, with a Glendale detective assigned to investigate the assault and a related incident. Bizarre. Jennifer Shen, uh, what should we make of that? Now, there's been some talk about whether or not he changed his story about what happened or his story was just misinterpreted. I have no idea about that, but I do have an idea about uh, September 5th, 2009. Got in some trouble here. What is that a red flag? Well, it is a red flag. One of the things I can tell you, having been in law enforcement for 30 plus years at this time, is that police take telling the truth very, very seriously. So if you are shown to be lying or, um, you know, not being truthful, particularly in some sort of investigation or anything that has to do with your job, you are going to get in trouble and you're going to have sustained findings. So that's what that is. I think he was probably saved by the fact that he came forward and uh, admitted what he had done. And so if he did that before the investigation, I mean, I think he's going to get a pass, but you cannot lie. And it is a red flag. You want your officers to tell the truth all the time. So I would worry also about that change in story about whether he hiked the mountain frequently or not at all, because it, it does make a big difference, I think, in the overall story. And it is concerning. Joseph Scott Morgan, um, 2009, he he, he admits to lying to another officer, and, it, and it's weird. It's like lying for, I don't know what they're trying to cover up. I, I wasn't there at the bar that night. But then there's the possibility of a changing story. That's not clear if it's a changing story or if the emergency worker misinterpreted what he said. Um, we'll let him figure that out. But are you concerned about this 2009 incident? Yeah, it goes to, goes to history. It goes to behavior. If if this has happened in the past and this comes up in the investigation, which obviously it has now, we have this information, it's something as an investigator, I'm going to take a long, hard look at and I'm going to dig deeper uh, relative to this. Ben, we're talking about the death of a young lady that was obviously in pretty good health, okay? So you've got somebody that is the firsthand witness here. The individual that was last seen with her alive, if he's got questionable behavior in the past uh, from an investigative standpoint, yeah, he's going under the microscope and maybe more intensely. And also, again, I go back to what I said earlier. People, Some people obviously ought to know better. If you're a police officer, you're practicing law enforcement in this environment. How in the world are you going to justify taking a stranger that's not familiar with this area out into this remote I say remote, but it's it, it's near Phoenix, obviously. But, you know, all you got to do is step out a little ways. And, man, you're out in the middle of no man's land out there, and you can't hydrate yourself. I mean, how many times has that preached over and over and over again? That's why I say he should have known better. And I don't understand why he would have her turn around and go back by herself. No, that, I don't either. That, it doesn't make sense, but we'll find out again uh, no foul play suspected. That's the official word coming out of Phoenix.